And here on Radio Rivendon, we have Lynn Rawley, the public relations officer of our own Rivendon City Theatre. Hello, Lynn. Hello. Now, the theatre is reopening soon after its three-year redevelopment program, isn't it? That's right, and there are a lot of improvements. The first thing people will see when they go in is that the foyer has been repainted in the original green and gold. Then the box office has been reoriented with its own access from the side of the building instead of through the foyer, which means it can be open longer hours and has more space too. The shop that used to be in the foyer, which sold books and CDs, is the one part of the redevelopment which isn't yet complete. The plan is to find new premises for it near the theatre, and we've had difficulty finding somewhere suitable. We hope to reopen the shop in the next few months. Will audiences find any difference in the auditorium? Yes, we've increased the legroom between the rows. Mm. This means that there are now fewer seats, but we're sure audiences will be much happier. And we've installed air conditioning, so it won't get so hot and stuffy. We already had a few seats which were suitable for wheelchair users, and now there are twice as many, which we hope will meet demand. Something else that will benefit audiences is the new lifts. The two we used to have were very small and slow. They've now gone, and we've got much more efficient ones. Anything for the performers? Yes, we've made a number of improvements backstage. The small dark dressing rooms we used to have have been converted into two large airy rooms, so they're much more comfortable now. And the state-of-the-art electronic sound and lighting systems have been installed. Okay, so what's the first play that audiences can see when the theatre reopens? We've got a very exciting production of Peter Schaffer's Royal Hunt of the Sun, which is currently touring the country. Mm -hmm. That starts on October the 13th and runs till the 19th. We're experimenting a bit with the time the curtain goes up. We used to start all our performances at 7.30, but that made it difficult for people to go home by public transport. So instead, we're beginning at 7, because at 9.45, when it finishes, there are still buses running. Uh -huh. Tickets are already selling fast. The Friday and Saturday performances sold out almost immediately, and in fact now there are only tickets for Monday and Thursday. Uh, how much are they? We've introduced a simpler price structure. Ticket prices used to range from £6 to £30, but now they're all £18. They're available from the box office, in person, by phone, fax or post, or online. OK, Lynn. Now, if you'd like to give the contact details... Thank you all for coming to my talk this evening. It's nice to see so many people in the audience. For those of you who don't know very much about PS Camping... Let me start by giving you some background information about the company. The company started 25 years ago. It actually opened as a retail chain selling camping equipment and then, 20 years ago, it bought a small number of campsites in the UK and began offering camping holidays. The company grew rapidly and has been providing holidays in continental Europe for the last 15 years. If you book a camping holiday with us, you'll have a choice of over 300 sites. In Italy, we now have some 64 sites that we either own or have exclusive use of. France is where we have the majority of sites, and we currently have a project to expand into Switzerland. We also have a number of sites in northern Spain, particularly in the mountainous region of Picos de Europa. We've upgraded all these Spanish sites and improved them considerably from their original three-star rating. We believe our holidays offer superb facilities for the whole family. Parents who want their children to be fully occupied for all or part of the day can take advantage of our children's activities. These are organised by our well-qualified and enthusiastic staff. Each day kicks off with a sports match, perhaps football or volleyball, followed by an hour of drama for everyone. This may include singing or dancing, mime or other activities. In the afternoon, there's a different art activity for each day of the week, including a poster competition or model making. What's more, our sites are truly child-friendly, and with this in mind, 
We operate a no noise rule in the evenings. Children's evening activities usually finish at 9:30 or occasionally 10, and from 10:30 holidaymakers are expected to be quiet in the areas where there are tents. We want nothing to go wrong on a PS camping holiday, but if it does, we also want all our customers to be insured. If you haven't organized an annual insurance policy of your own, you'll need to take out the low-cost cover we offer, and we require that you arrange this when you make your holiday reservation. There are many advantages to choosing PS camping and to recommending it to others. As a regular customer, you'll be kept informed of special offers, and your friends can benefit from 10% off their holiday or book a luxury tent for the price of a standard one. In return, we'll send you a thank you present, which you can choose from a list of high-quality items. When it comes to our tents, these are equipped to the highest standard. We really do think of every essential detail, from an oven and cooking rings fueled by bottled gas to mirrors in the bedroom areas. If you don't want to cook indoors, you can borrow a barbecue if you ask in advance for one to be made of. Hello. Um, my family and I are staying here in Trebirch for a week or two, and we wanted to know about the train services. We're hoping to do a few local trips. Okay. Well, I can give you lots of details about all the trains going from Trebirch in the southwest. This leaflet will be very helpful, but I can tell you some of the main things. We've got two main train stations in the town. King Street is for local commuter lines and regional services. What about trains to London? I'll need to go there on business for one day. Then you need to go to Central Station. That's for all the national services. There are regular trains to London. They leave Trebirch every half hour on weekdays and every hour at weekends. It takes about two hours, a bit longer on Sundays. You've got a choice of first and second class, and there's a buffet car. Though refreshments are included in the cost of a first-class ticket. Ah, uh, right.、Um, and have you got any information on different ticket types? Yes, there's a range of ticket prices depending on when you travel and when you buy your ticket. There's a standard open ticket which doesn't have any restrictions.、Mm -hmm. This can be bought in advance or on the day. You can also get various discounted tickets. A popular one is called the Super Save, and、uh, this is okay for travel after 8:45. Then there is the special ticket, which is valid for travel after 10:15. The special tickets are also valid for travel at weekends.、Mm -hmm. uh, the cheapest tickets are called Advance, and you have to buy them at least six days ahead. Only a certain number are available, and you have to make seat reservations for these. Thanks. And are there lots of places to go to around here? Oh yes, you can enjoy many days out.、Um, there's the Merthyr Mining Museum, which is only half an hour from Trebirch by train. Your children will find it just as fascinating as any theme park, and they can ride in the original miners' lifts and on the coal trains.、Uh -huh. There are special excursion tickets which include entrance fees. Mainline trains also offer direct services to Bristol, where you can visit the docks or spend a great day out with the children in the zoo, which is set in the parkland that used to surround the old castle.、Uh -huh. Uh, special family away day fares are available for this service now during the school holidays.、Uh, alternatively, you can be in Birmingham in only an hour and a half, where there's lots to see and do, including the new and internationally acclaimed climbing wall built on the site of the old aquarium.、Mm -hmm. We will also be running a special service to Newport when the new science museum opens next year, as we anticipate a lot of visitors in the opening weeks. I'd advise you to call early to book your tickets. Is that okay? Yes, thanks. Thank you for calling the tourist line. There are many different ways of getting round the city, and we'd like to suggest some you may not have thought of. How about a city trip by boat?
There are four main stopping points. From west to east, stop A, Green Banks, stop B, City Bridge, stop C, Roman Landing, and stop D, Newtown. You can find the main booking office at stop A. The first boat leaves at 8 a.m. and the last one at 6.30 p.m. There are also many attractions you can visit along the river. At stop A, if you have time, you can visit the fine 16th century palace here, built for the king with its beautiful formal gardens. It's very near the booking office. Now you can enjoy every corner of this superb residence. Stop B. Why don't you visit Tower Restaurant with its wide range of refreshments? This is a place where you can sit and enjoy the wonderful views over the old commercial and banking centre of the city. Stop C is the area where, in the first century AD, invading soldiers crossed the river. This was much shallower than it is now. That's why this area is called Roman Landing. There's an interactive museum to visit here, with a large shop which has a good range of local history books. At the furthest point of the trip, Stop D, the most exciting place to visit is the new entertainment complex with seven-screen cinema, bowling alley and video games arcade. Besides the boat tours, there are city buses. Two companies offer special services. The top bus company runs all its tours with a live commentary in English. Tours leave from 8.30 a.m. every 20 minutes. There are departures from Central Station, Castle Hill and Long Walk. This is a hop-on, hop-off service and tickets are valid for 24 hours. For further details, call Top Bus on 0208 944 7810. The number one sightseeing tour is available with a commentary in eight languages. Buses depart from Central Station every five to six minutes from about 9 a.m., with the last bus at around 7 p.m. There are also number one services with an English speaker. Hi, can I help you? I was told to come here because I'd like to talk to someone about taking a management course. Right. I'm one of the tutors, so I should be able to help you. Oh, good. Uh, my name's Brian Ardley. I've decided to enrol on a part-time management course. A friend of mine took one last year and recommended it to me. Right. Is there anything I should do before the course, like reading or anything? We prefer to integrate reading with the course, so we don't give out a reading list in advance. But we like people to write a case study describing an organisation they know. I've already done that, as my friend told me you wanted one. But would it be possible to sit in on a teaching session to see what it's like? I haven't been a student for quite a while. Fine. Just let me know which date and I'll arrange it with the tutor. Now, could I ask you about the college facilities, please? Anything in particular? Well, the course is one day a week, all day, isn't it? So, presumably, it's possible to buy food. Yes, the refectory is open all day. Does it cater for special diets? I have some food allergies. Provided you warn the refectory in advance, it won't be a problem. Good. What about facilities for young children? I'd like to bring my daughter here while I'm studying. How old is she? Three. Then she's eligible to join the nursery, which is supervised by a qualified nursery nurse. The waiting list for a place is quite long, though, so you ought to apply now. OK. I don't know if our careers advice service would be of any interest to you. Yes, it might help me decide how to develop my career after the course. The centre has a lot of reference materials and staff qualified to give guidance on a one-to-one -one basis. I noticed a fitness centre next to the college. Is that for students? It's open to everyone, but students pay an annual fee that's much less than the general public pay. And presumably the college library stocks newspapers and journals as well as books. Yes, and there's also an audio-visual room for viewing and listening to videos, cassettes and so on. 
Is there also access to computers? Yes. Your tutor will need to arrange with a technical support team for you to get a password, so ask him or her about it when you start the course. OK. By the way, do you know about our business centre? No. What's that? It's a training resource, a collection of materials for people to study on their own or use in their own organisations. Uh-huh. You mean books and videos? Yes, and manuals for self-study plus a lot of computer-based materials so people can work through them at their own speed and repeat anything they aren't sure about. And you can hire laptops to use in your own home or workplace, as well as printers that you can take away. Does it have anything that I could use to improve my study skills? I don't have much idea about report writing, and I'm sure I'll need it on the course. Oh, yes, there's plenty of useful material. Just ask one of the staff. Does the centre cover all the main areas of business? Yes. Topics like finance and, of course, marketing. That's a popular one. Local managers seem to queue up to borrow the videos. So it isn't just for students, then? No, it's for members only, but anyone can join. How much does it cost? £100 a year for a company and £50 for an individual, with no discount for students, I'm afraid. Well, that's very helpful. Well, I think that's all. I'd better go home and fill in the enrolment form. Thanks for all your help. You're welcome. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, you've both been looking at different styles of managing individuals in companies and the workplace. How's the research going, Philip? Well, I've been looking at why individualism, I mean, individual differences, are such an important area of management studies. When you think about any organisation, be it a family business or a multinational company, they're all fundamentally a group of people working together. But it's what these individuals contribute to their places of work that makes you realise how important they are. Of course, they bring different ideas, but it's also their attitudes and their experiences of learning. Diversity is important in these areas too. So why do people behave so differently from one another at work? There are lots of reasons, but research has shown that a lot of it comes down to personality. And the other factor is gender. It's a well-known fact that men and women do lots of things in different ways, and the workplace is no different. Did you look at the effects of this variation on companies? Yes, I did. On the positive side, exposure to such diversity helps encourage creativity, which is generally an asset to a company. But unfortunately, individual differences are also the root of conflict between staff, and they can lead to difficulties for management, which can sometimes be serious. Thanks, Philip. So now I guess the two main things to remember here are to identify individual talent and then to utilise it. So, Janice, you were looking at identifying different talents in workers. Do you think this is easy for managers to do? Well, currently, teamwork is in fashion in the workplace, and in my opinion, the importance of the individual is generally neglected. What managers should be targeting is those employees who can take the lead in a situation and are not afraid to accept the idea of responsibility. Mm, that's true, Janice, but unfortunately, many managers think the entire notion of encouraging individuality amongst their staff is far too hard. Yes, that may be true, but I think one of the most important tasks of managers is to consider the needs of the individual on one hand and group cooperation and conformity on the other. It requires creative thinking on the part of management to avoid tension. So, Janice, what kind of people do you think companies should be looking for? Well, it has to start from the very beginning, when companies are looking for new employees. When the personnel department is choosing between applicants, they need to look for someone who's broken the mould and can think for themselves. Instead, people making these decisions often use a range of psychological tests to see if a person is a problem solver or will do as they're told. I'm not convinced these qualities are actually the most important. So do you think being a good team player is overrated? No. It's not overrated. You do need to learn the rules and learn them fast. No individual can get around this if you're working in an organisation. So how should managers deal with this? Rewards. 
When an individual demonstrates the behaviour the organisation expects, some kind of incentive can be given. What's important here is that this happens right at the beginning, so new recruits learn the rules of the system immediately. Also, the incentive should be something the individual actually wants, and this isn't always just money. Hmm. To come back to you, Philip, you were saying that recognition of good performers is essential.、Mm. Now, what else should managers be looking for? Well, managing people means you not only have an understanding of your employees, but you also recognise the culture of the organisation. In fact, for some organisations, creativity and individuality may be the last thing they want to see during working hours. Very true. Yes. But managing people isn't as easy as it looks. For example, change in the workplace can be quite tricky, especially if there's a need to increase profit. And at times like these, managers may have to give priority to profit rather than individual staff needs.、Mm, yes, and that creates difficult situations for people. Yes, but what's important is that managers are able to deal with quite high levels of personal stress. During times of change, they should be thinking not only about the strain on their staff, but take time out to think of themselves. Absolutely. So, Sandy, how have you been getting on with your dissertation? Fine, and I've been working hard on the various action points we agreed on our last tutorial. Do you want to talk me through what you've done? Yeah, sure. Well, we agreed on three main targets for me to aim for. The first one was to find out about suitable data analysis software. Yes. And what I decided to do was to look through catalogues specialising in IT. That's a good idea. What did you come up with? I found the names of two promising ones. Right. But I also thought it'd be worthwhile talking to a lecturer. Oh, right. Who did you see? Jane Prince. Do you know her? She's in the computer centre. Yes, of course. She's the new head. Yes. Well, she was very helpful. Oh, that's good. Did she suggest anything in particular? Yeah, she recommended software called Vivat, and said I should book up for a couple of practice sessions using Vivat. Great. I'm sure you'll find them useful. And of course, the second target was to draw up a survey checklist, which. Yes,、I、you emailed me it、uh, last week. Have you had a chance to look? Of course. <laughs> um, I think it's good,、uh, very much on the right lines. I'd say your first two sections are spot on.、Mm-hmm. I wouldn't suggest that you change anything there, but in section three, you really do need to have questions on teaching experience. Yeah, I was thinking that section looked a bit short. Right. And my third target was do further reading on discipline. Oh yes, I mentioned a couple of writers, didn't I? Yes. Well, I got hold of the Banerjee, and I thought that was excellent. But I'm afraid I didn't manage to get hold of the essays about classroom management.、Mm. You know, the ones by Simon Erickson. The bookshop said it was out of print, and the library doesn't have a copy. Oh right, and I'm afraid I've lent my copy to another student.、Mm. Uh, what I suggest you do is try the library again. This time, apply for it through the service called Special Loans. Have、uh-huh. you done that before?、Uh, you're entitled to six books a year. Yes, no problem. That's what I'll do. So, lots of useful work done. So, let's look at some new targets. We'll start by having a chat about your chapter one.、Mm-hmm. I very much enjoyed reading it. <laughs> your written style is very clear, and you've included lots of interesting descriptions of education in your target area. I've just got a couple of suggestions for some additional work. Of course. Could I just ask, what do you think I should call it? Well, I'd go for something like context review. What do you think? Well, short and to the point. Exactly. Now, as regards specific areas to work on, I'd be quite interested to have a few more statistics about the schools in the different zones. Oh, that wouldn't be a problem. I can get them from the internet. Great. And although you did make a reference to quite a few different writers, I think you should aim to cite more works written later than 2000. Okay, that's more difficult, but I can try.、Mm-hmm. When do you want that done by? Oh, it's not urgent.、Um, I should aim for the end of term.、Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, I think you should also be thinking about chapter two. Should I be drafting it already? No, but I think you should note down its main sections. Yes. 
You know, I always find that the hardest part. Yeah, I always find it helpful to put some ideas on index cards. Yeah. Um, and then you can sort them and even lay them out on the floor. It's a, it's a real help. Well, I'll certainly try it.、Okay. When would the deadline be for that? My advice would be to get it done before you embark upon the research.、Uh, you can always change it later if you need to. Okay, I'll get going on that.、Then. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Martin Merriweather of the Antarctic Centre in Christchurch, New Zealand, who has come along to talk to us today about the role of the centre and the Antarctic Treaty. Now, my first question is about the choice of location for the centre. Why Christchurch? Was it because of the climate? Well, actually, New Zealand is the second closest country to Antarctica, and Christchurch is often used on Antarctic expeditions. Right, so it's because of where we are, coupled with our historical role. So tell us, what is the main purpose of the centre? Oh well, we have two complementary roles. One is as a scientific base for expeditions and research, and the other is as an information centre. Tell us something about the role as a scientific base. Well, we're able to provide information about what scientists should take with them to the South Pole. For example. The centre contains a clothing warehouse where expeditions are supplied with suitable clothing for the extreme conditions. I suppose you need a bit more than your normal winter coat. Yes, exactly. And then there's also the specialist library and mapping services. Right. And which countries are actually located at the centre? Well, the centre houses research programs for New Zealand, for the United States, as well as for Italy. There's even a U.S. post office at the American Air Force Base here. Really, and what does the visitor center offer? Well, since very few people will ever experience the Antarctic firsthand, the visitor center aims to recreate the atmosphere of Antarctica. There's a mock campsite where you can see inside an Antarctic tent and imagine yourself sleeping there. <laughs> And the centre also acts as a showcase for the unique international cooperation which exists in Antarctica today. What is it actually like at the South Pole? I know you've been there on a number of occasions. Yes, I have, and each time I'm struck by the awesome beauty of the place. It's magnificent, but you can really only visit it in the summer months. October to March. Yes, because it's completely dark for four months of the year. And in addition, it has to be the coldest place on Earth. Colder than the North Pole? Why is that? Ah, well, unlike the North Pole, which is actually a frozen sea, Antarctica is a landmass shaped like a dome, with the result that the winds blow down the slopes at speeds of up to a hundred and fifty kilometers an hour, and that's what makes it so cold.、Oh. And one other interesting thing is that Antarctica is the driest continent on Earth, surprisingly, and so you have to drink large amounts of water when you're there. How old is Antarctica? Oh, we're pretty sure it was part of a larger landmass, but it broke away from the rest of the continent 170 million years ago. How can you be certain of this? Because fossils and rocks have been discovered in Antarctica, which are the same as those found in places such as Africa and Australia. Amazing. To think that it was once attached to Africa. Now let's just have a look at the Antarctic Treaty. How far back does the idea of an international treaty go? Well, as far back as the nineteenth century, when eleven nations organised an international event. When was that exactly? In eighteen seventy, and it was called the Polar Research Meeting. And then, not long after that. They organised something called the first international polar year, and that took place when exactly? Over two years, from 1882 to 1883, but it wasn't until the 1950s that the idea of an international treaty was proposed, and in 1959, the treaty was actually signed. What do you see as the main achievements of the treaty? Well, firstly, it means that the continent is reserved for peaceful use. That's Article One, isn't yeah. it? Yes. That's important since the territory belongs to everyone. Yes, but not as important as Article Five, which prohibits any nuclear explosions or waste disposal. Which is marvelous. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there because I'm afraid we've run out of time. 
Thanks for coming along today and telling us all about the centre and its work.